Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is a sequel to The Werewolves of Terror Vale by the incredible mind of Luke Reason, exclusive to the DMT Fries to Fear channel. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. And titled Vampires of the Shadowlands. Let's get straight into that. Hello everyone, my name is Arthur. Eldest son of Romulus, or Morgrim, as he is better known. Let's just say I have a lot to live up to. My father, 21 years ago, slew the Night Stalker with a legendary blade, Excalibur, and thus freeing us from the curse. Chapter 1 Old Familiar and New Enemies. Let's get straight into that. My younger brother Bane is not like me. He's brash, reckless and stupid, and it is for those very reasons that I had to banish him when this happened. Well, let me explain what I mean. It all started about a week ago. When my brother was exploring the secret passageways and chambers that lay underneath the city of Terra Vale. When after about an hour of wandering around, he came upon an old vault our father happened to have warned us about, continuously when we were growing up. But clearly in this moment, my brother had no respect for our father's memory or authority as he took it upon himself to uncover all the secrets that Terra Vale had to offer. He opened the vault door and went inside, and upon entering the vault, the last terror hound in the whole of Garamond bounded forwards with alarming speed, and before my brother could react in time to defend himself, the beast had sunk its fangs deep into his arm, and thus the old familiar curse that had plagued my mother, father, and all of our people was reborn. But this time, there was no way to break the curse, no night stalker to slay, and no tomb to keep my brother from becoming a feral. Well, that's what our father used to call the lichens that had not read the tomb of the beast. When my brother slew the beast and quickly exited the city underbelly, however, the damage was done, and now the city, its people, and all of the world would be in danger. Upon my brother's return to her family home late that night, my mother, may the gods watch over her, immediately realized that my brother had been bitten. His eyes glowed a sickly yellow and his skin grew pale and ghostly. She rushed him into the basement and began chaining his arms and feet to the back wall so that he could not leave and cause any harm to anyone else within the city. However, in her rush to secure him before the first full moon shone brightly in the sky, she received a shallow scratch on her right forearm. And straight away she knew that she was infected. And she did not wish to become a beast again like before, and so she picked up a silver knife that my brother always carried with him, wherever he went, and she slit her own throat. Now my brother having already fully transformed at this point just licked his giant wolf-like lips and dragged my mother towards him until she was near enough for him to devour. And come morning, all the remained of my dear sweet mother was her skeleton. The bones had been picked dry of all of its flesh. And as for my brother, well, he was curled up in the corner of the room, fast asleep, coated in blood, her blood, and mother's blood. And I lost my shit in that short moment of time between seeing my mother's remains and the state my brother was in. I stomped up to him with such primal rage in my heart and kicked him in the stomach, roaring, Get up! Get up now, you piece of shit! Look at what you did to our mother. She was immortal. She could have lived until the end of time. I still can as I am half-elven, but you shall not see another full moon, my brother. I then lowered my voice to a sickly sweet whisper before Adam. Don't worry, brother. I am not going to kill you. Death is too merciful for someone like you. Instead, you are banished from Terra Vale. Leave this city and never return. I then drew out Dad's old sword, Excalibur, and proceeded to cut the chains that bound my brother to the back wall of the basement. And once he was on his feet, I summoned a couple of elite guards who I had specially trained to combat lichens, orcs and trolls, to escort my brother from the city. 
And it has been two years since I banished my brother and buried my mother's skeleton. Not a single day has gone by without me wishing I could have been with my mother to help her when she needed me most. But I had a duty to uphold as the king of the elves. Someone needed to be there to govern the people to ensure that all requests were met. And I can honestly say that I regret my decision to exile and not kill my brother. But he was my brother, my blood, and my best friend. I know he didn't do this heinous act willingly, or knowingly, but the fact remains that our father warned us of the evil that dwelt under the city, and my brother chose not to listen, but instead to do as he has always done, act upon impulse. Now my uncle Rega has been a massive help for me these past few years, counselling me on matters of state concerning my two kingdoms, and races of which I was their king. As I am half-elven, it gives me a claim to the throne of the woodland realm, and half-human giving me authority over the human survivors of our haven, and effectively giving me the role of king, or more specifically, Lord Protector. Now about a week ago, I received a very worrisome report concerning my cursed mongrel of a brother. Apparently, a lichen scout infiltrated the city of Terra Vale and escaped with the tomb of the beast. Now, this was very concerning news because now werewolves have the opportunity to regain control of their minds when they transform. My brother no longer has an excuse for committing his heinous crimes. Meanwhile, whilst we were dealing with the old familiar curse of lycanthropy, a new darkness was creeping its way into the north of Garamond. A new species of immortals began to forge a kingdom of their own, deep within the Shadowlands. One day I gathered my war castle together in the Great Hall, and there we discussed the new immortals, and whether or not we could trust them, and what were their intentions. The latter point was of the utmost importance, as we had only just secured peace across the world, with all races that the previous war had affected. I ultimately decided to assemble our armies of men and elves, send envoys to the dwarves and request further aid from the holy city. I then spent a good hour or so pondering whether to send a messenger to my brother and ask for his aid, as the lichens would be essential. And after I'd paced around the table in the meeting room for the tenth time, I finally decided to bury the hatchet for the time being and ask for aid from the lichens. Now, three days later, we assembled at the base of the White Mountains and proceeded to wait until our allies, begrudged or loyal, arrived. And once everyone had assembled, I called a meeting with all of the leaders in order for us to plan our attack on the vampires in the Shadow Lands. And as I expected, my brother did indeed show up. However, he showed no sign that he knew me, and instead pretended that I was just another racial leader and not his brother. Obviously, he still feels hurt and betrayed, that I cast him out. But honestly, what did he expect? He killed and consumed our mother. The fact that he wasn't even remotely remorseful had really angered me and prevented me from being able to sit down and discuss his actions and my punishment. However, we needed to put that to one side and focus on the task at hand, which was to destroy the blood-sucking parasites in the Shadow Lands. After three days of planning and strategizing, we departed from the base of the White Mountains for the Shadowlands. We thought we were the largest army in all of Garamond, but sadly, we were mistaken, though we did not notice at that time. We reached the borders of the Shadowlands after two consecutive days of marching, only to find an army thrice the size of ours waiting for us. A tall, pale-faced humanoid astride a handsome black stallion cantered elegantly towards us until he halted fifty meters away from us. And as we had him rested for two days, I approached the leader of the opposing army and spoke with him in private, demanding that he gives us two days to rest and recover. However, he simply laughed in my face and said very loudly so that everyone could hear him, Mercy is for the weak. You will find no mercy in my realm. If you are tired, then you will die as easily as a knife slicing through bread. He then turned his horse around and galloped away back to his army. And not two minutes later, the first wave of the Vampire Lord's army began its assault on our combined forces. However, we just about managed to repel them, whilst losing many troops in the process. Then the second wave hit us like a truck before we could recover from the initial assault. Finally, after hours and hours of fighting, we defeated the second wave. However, 
there were less than half of our initial army remaining. Definitely not enough to win, and so I called a tactical retreat to an old fortress outpost that had once belonged to my father when he was still king of the Lycans, and from the old outpost we were able to hold our enemies at bay. And whilst we were in the midst of battle, one of my father's companions, Magalnis, the youngest among my father's infiltration squad, wandered into the heart of the vampire kingdom, and before we could do much more than scream out his name, the vampire lord swooped down upon him and bit him on the neck, turning him into a vampire. Not long after, both he and the vampire lord retreated into the darkness, never to be seen again for ten years. Meanwhile, his followers continued to attack us for three grueling months, and slowly we whittled down their numbers. However, we were simultaneously suffering equal losses, if not much worse. We concluded our war with the vampires after three months, and a few of us that remained from each kingdom and race returned home to our kingdoms and then rested, all of us trying to forget about the screaming of soldiers as they were shredded, or the sound of laughter from the vampires as they mocked us for hiding within the stronghold, and not facing them upon open ground like a brave army should do. Now for the next year and a half, we had an influx of refugees from smaller cities and neighbouring towns pouring into Terra Vale. And after six months of this, I began to get quite concerned, seeing how we thought we destroyed the vampires. Little did we know that Magonis had killed his vampire master and proclaimed himself as the true vampire lord. And he began rebuilding the ranks of the once powerful vampire army, back to its former glory, using the humans of... Gevermont. Chapter 2 The Second War Let's get straight into that. After nearly a year of fending off attacks throughout Gevermont, I decided to approach my brother with a proposition, something that would benefit both of us. If he turned myself and my army into werewolves, then I would provide him with the funds to rebuild Arbor Haven so that he may rule a kingdom and city of his own. We shook hands before he and his followers began to convert us into the hulking beasts that our fathers, brothers and uncles were during the reign of the Night Stalker. Once the last soldier was bitten, I addressed the army, stating, I know the cure to this curse, however none of us shall receive it until the very last vampire is slain. I then turned to my brother and said, You and your pack are under my command, brother. Betray me and you'll never see the light of day again. He then looked at me dead in the eyes and said, Do not assume that you have authority over me or my pack. You have my army, but I am not your soldier, not since you kicked me out of Terra Vale. I then snapped back. You murdered and devoured my mother. You murdered and devoured my mother. The fact that you are still alive and breathing is a testament of my restraint and mercy, Pop. Now get out of my sight. You are dismissed. My brother and his troops left the castle. The next day, I set about reassembling the army and marching to the White Mountains, where the last orc clan dwelled. A big and bulky-looking orc stood outside his castle gates waiting for me. He was flanked by four heavily armoured orc brutes. I approached him with confidence, and when I was about five feet away, I bowed to the orc chief before saying, There is a darkness spreading once more. Only by uniting do we stand a chance. Of victory. The orc stood there in silence for a few minutes, contemplating what I had just said before saying, I agree, however, we are the last orcs in existence. Therefore, I cannot take every warrior into battle for fear of what might happen to our women and children if we brutes were all slain in battle. Therefore, you must make do with half. I bowed again before saying, I shall expect you in three days upon the barren plains. And the next day my army and I travelled to the holy city and recruited the army of the faith. Although reluctant at first, they finally relented, after we eventually convinced them that it was through their holy magic that we were able to defeat the vampires the last time. Next, we travelled back to the White Mountains, only this time it was the base of the mountains, where the White Mountain dwarves dwelled. Once again, we were successfully securing the aid of an ally before setting up camp outside the mountains. In the day after that, we had to travel a great distance to reach the woodland realm. 
I knew that they would automatically join us in this war, as both myself and my brother Prior to become in Lycans were half-elven, and our mother was the former queen of the elves, meaning we by rights of inheritance and blood had a right to officially declare ourselves as kings. However, I was the oldest son. I was the only one that had the legitimate claim to the throne for the time being. The following day we set off for the woodland realm, hoping that the journey wouldn't be too long and arduous. And after a solid day and a half of non-stop running in our canine forms, we finally arrived at the city gates of the elves' capital city. I called forth for Governor Wolfric to meet us at the gates, and he greeted us with a warm welcome before asking. I should explain that he was not really mine or my brother's uncle, but as he was so close and a loyal friend to our late father and mother, we always treated him like an uncle. And I replied with a rather hasty, And as your king, I expect both yourself and the elves to be ready to depart for the Shadow Lands in the late evening. He then looked taken aback by my forbearance at first. However, he soon regained his composure, bowing to me before saying, It will be done, my lord. And I suddenly felt very confident, having secured more forces for the upcoming war, especially since I knew the vampires did not know that we were coming this time, as they were too busy raiding the villages of Geramond. I had spent years secretly garrisoning each and every village and having defensive structures built to better protect the people. Therefore, I knew that the vampires led by Malganis would not stand a chance against us. When we swept in from their rear, with a heavily overwhelming and overprepared army, However, I soon received some very bad news to put a dampener on my confidence. Malganis had heard rumours of an army of beasts. Men and elves decided to go into hiding yet again in order to prolong the war and successfully plan a counter-attack that would debilitate all mortal races of Garamond. And as I expected, when we finally arrived back in the Shadowlands, we saw no sign of any vampire activity anywhere because they had managed to completely circumvent our armies, and then to further rub salt in the wound, we later found out that they were now in the heart of the human kingdom of Arbor Haven, which had recently been restored and given to my brother and his followers to rule. As we prepared for battle, I could feel the weight of the responsibility upon my shoulders. The people of Geramon were counting on me to lead them to victory, and I knew that failure well, it was not an option. I took a deep breath and looked out to the sea of the enemy soldiers before us. Morgoth's army was vast and powerful, but I refused to be intimidated. I drew my sword and raised it high, signalling for my companions to do the same. And we charged forward, ready to face whatever lay ahead. And the battle was fierce and chaotic, but we fought with all of our might, determined to protect our land and our people. And despite the odds stacked against us, I knew that we could not give up. Our cause was just, and we would fight until the bitter end. And by the time we arrived at Arbor Haven and engaged with the vampires, we were already too late to save my brother, the people, and the city. I raged in silence with myself, now having lost almost everybody I loved, first my father, to time, and then my mother to my brother, and the like and curse, and now my brother. I was broken inside with only anger, hatred, and revenge left to try and fill the void where my family ought to be. Now, only Rhaegar, my actual uncle, Uncle Warfric, and Uncle Remus remained. We took a moment to honor the fallen, lit a candle in the memory of my brother. Rhaegar placed a comforting hand upon my shoulder, and I drew strength from his presence. Warfric and Remus shared words of wisdom and hope, reminding us that the war was far from over. Morgoth and his army were still out there, and we needed to regroup and plan our next move. The loss of Arbor Haven well, it was devastating, but it also served as a harsh reminder that we could not afford to let our guard down. We needed to stay vigilant and focused, for the fate of Geramond resting upon our shoulders. Together, we vowed to continue the fight and to honor the memory of those who had fallen in battle. We travelled to the nearby village of Oakwood to regroup and gather supplies. The villagers greeted us with open arms, grateful for our assistance in fighting off the vampire attacks. We shared stories of our battles and experiences, and the villagers provided us with food, weapons, and healing potions. 
It was heartwarming to see how the freed people of Garamond banded together in times of crisis, and it reminded me that we were not alone in this fight. As we rested and replenished our supplies, we discussed our next move. We knew that Morgoth was still out there. We needed to find a way to stop him. We decided to visit the Oracle of the High Mountains, a wise and powerful seer who had helped us in the past. Now, the journey would be treacherous, but we were determined to seek her guidance and advice. And after days and days of travel, we finally reached the Oracle's mountain lair. She greeted us warmly and listened to our tale of woe. She consulted her crystal ball and foretold a grim future. Morgoth had uncovered an ancient artifact, the Bloodstone of Azuria, which gave him immense power and made him nearly invincible. The only way to defeat him was to destroy the Bloodstone, but it was well guarded and heavily protected. Undeterred, we set out to find the Bloodstone and destroy it. It was a perilous journey, and we faced many challenges and obstacles along the way. We fought off hordes of vampires, crossed treacherous rivers, and climbed steep mountain peaks. But we persevered, driven by our desire to save Garamond from Morgoth's tyranny. And finally, we reached the Bloodstone's location, a dark and foreboding castle on the edge of the world. Morgoth and his minions were waiting for us, but we were not afraid. We charged forward, weapons raised and engaged in a fierce battle that lasted for hours. In the end, we emerged victorious, having destroyed the Bloodstone and defeated Morgoth once and for all. Or so we thought. And the free people of Garamond rejoiced, and we returned home as heroes, with the knowledge that our sacrifices and struggles had not been in vain. As we returned to our respective kingdoms, we were welcomed as heroes, the people of Garamond threw a grand celebration in our honour. We were showered with gifts and accolades, but we knew that our work was not yet done. The war had taken a toll on our people, and we needed to rebuild and heal. We spent the next few months working tirelessly, repairing cities, rebuilding homes, and tending to the wounded. It was a long and arduous process, but we were determined to make Garamond great again. And during our time of peace, I took the opportunity to reflect on my past and my future. I realized that I had been so consumed by my desire for revenge that I had lost sight of what truly mattered. I had let my anger and hatred blind me, and in doing so, I had caused pain and suffering to those around me. I made a vow to myself that I would never let emotions control me again, and that I would always strive to be just and a fair ruler. The years went by and Garamond prospered under our leadership. We had forged a new alliance between the free peoples, and one that was built on trust, respect, and mutual understanding. The war with the vampires or had brought us together. We had emerged stronger and more united than ever before. The memory of my fallen family well, still haunted me, but I had found solace in knowing that they had not died in vain. And as I looked out upon the people of Garamond, I felt a sense of pride and satisfaction. I had come a long way from the angry and vengeful young king that I once was. I had learned the true meaning of leadership, sacrifice, and courage, and I knew that as long as I had the support of my people, I could face any challenge that lay ahead. And so I raised my hand in a gesture of unity, and the people of Garamond cheered, and together we had overcome adversity and emerged victorious, and as long as we stood together, there was nothing that could stop us. The future of Garamond, oh, I was bright, and I knew that I had played a small part in making it so. Chapter 3 The Shadow Returns Let's get straight into that. Twenty years had passed since the defeat of Morgoth and his vampire army. The people of Garamond had enjoyed a time of peace and prosperity, but that was all about to change. Rumours were beginning to spread of a dark presence lurking in the shadows, and it wasn't long before the truth was revealed. Morgoth had somehow found a way to return, and he was more powerful than ever before. I was no longer the young king that I once was. I had aged gracefully, but the scars of the past still haunted me. 
and as soon as we receive word of Morgoth's return, I summon my most trusted advisors to a council of war. Uncle Rhaegar, Uncle Wolfric, Uncle Remus, and Governor Wolfram of the Woodland Realm all came to my side, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. And the news was grim. Morgoth had spent the past twenty years gathering his forces and building his army and preparing for his return. He had made alliances with other dark forces, and they were all united under his banner. The free peoples of Garamond were vastly outnumbered, and our armies were scattered across the land. We knew that we needed to act fast. Morgoth was already on the move, and he was heading straight for the heart of Garamond. We made a decision to split our forces, sending Rhaegar and Remus to gather reinforcements from the far corners of the world, while Wolfric, Wolfram and I stayed behind to defend our kingdoms. The battles that followed were fierce and bloody. Morgoth's armies, well, they were relentless, and they seemed to have an endless supply of soldiers. We fought with all of our might, but it was clear that we were on losing ground. The cities and towns that we had worked so hard to rebuild were now being destroyed once again. And as the war raged on, I began to feel the weight of my responsibility as a leader. The decisions that I made could mean the difference between life and death for many people. I had to be strong, but at times I felt like the weight of the world was upon my shoulders. And years went by and the war with Morgoth continued to rage on. We lost many brave soldiers and friends, and it seemed like there was no end in sight. But we refused to give up. We had come too far and sacrificed too much to let Morgoth win. As the war dragged on, I began to notice a change in myself. I had become more hardened, more stoic. I had seen too much death and destruction to let my emotions get the better of me. But at the same time, I knew that I had to maintain my humanity, or else I would become just like Morgoth. But despite our best efforts, Morgoth continued to gain ground. He had managed to capture several key cities, and his armies were closing in on the capital. We knew that we had to make a final stand, or else all would be lost. And so, we rallied our forces for one last battle. We gathered every able-bodied man and woman, every soldier, every ally that we could muster. It was a desperate move, but, well, we had no other choice. And the battle was unlike anything we'd ever seen before. Morgoth's armies were massive, and they seemed to be everywhere at once. But we fought with all of our might, driven by belief that we were fighting for something greater than ourselves. In the end, it was a small group of us who faced Morgoth directly. It was a battle to end all battles, and the fate of Garamond hung in the balance. We fought with everything we had, but it was clear that Morgoth was too powerful for us. And as the years passed, Morgoth's army grew stronger and more organized. His vampire generals, once fractured and disunited, now worked in perfect harmony under his command. The once mighty forces of Garamond were pushed back city by city, until they were left with only a few strongholds scattered throughout the land. Ah, I remember those dark years vividly. Our people were on the brink of extinction, and hope seemed like a distant memory. The once beautiful cities of Garamond were now ruins, a testament to the destruction rout by Morgoth's army. It was a constant struggle just to survive. But we did not give up. We could not give up. We held on to the belief that somehow, some way, we would find a way to defeat Morgoth and restore peace to our world. And so, we fought on. In small skirmishes and guerrilla attacks, always looking for weaknesses in the enemy's defences. And it was during one of these skirmishes that we stumbled upon a clue that would change everything. We had managed to capture one of Morgoth's scouts, and under interrogation, he revealed that there was a secret realm where Morgoth was hiding, a place that even his utmost trusted lieutenants did not know about. This was our chance. If we could find this secret realm, we might be able to strike at the heart of Morgoth's power and end the war once and for all. We gathered a small group of our bravest warriors and set out on a perilous journey to find this hidden place. It took us months of travel and countless dangers to finally reach the secret realm, but when we did, we found it to be unlike anything we'd ever seen before. It was a place of darkness and decay, where twisted creatures roamed the landscape and the air was thick with the stench of death. 
but we did not falter. We pressed on, driven by the hope that we could end the war and bring peace to our world, when finally we came upon Morgoth himself. He was more powerful than ever before, and it seemed like nothing we could do could harm him. But we fought on with all of our might, determined to stop him once and for all. It was a brutal and exhausting battle, but finally we managed to land a decisive blow, and Morgoth fell to the ground defeated. For a moment there was silence, and as we all stood there staring at the fallen villain, very suddenly he vanished, disappearing into thin air before our very eyes. We searched the secret realm but could find no trace of Morgoth. It was as if he had never been there at all. But we knew that he could not be gone for good. Somewhere out there he was biding his time, waiting for his chance to strike again. And so, with nothing left, we returned to Geramond, victorious but wary. We knew that the war was not over, and that Morgoth would one day return to seek his revenge. But for the moment, we celebrated a hard-won victory and held on to the hope that one day we would finally bring lasting peace to our world. Yet again, our enemy seemed to elude us, slipping through our fingers like sand. It was frustrating beyond measure, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of hopelessness creeping over me. We had been fighting this war for so long, and it seemed like there was no end in sight. But we couldn't give up. We had to keep fighting, even if the odds were stacked against us. We owed it to the people of Geramon to keep going, to never surrender to the darkness that threatened to engulf us all. And in the years that followed, we continued to mount attacks against Morgoth's forces. We took back some cities, only to lose them again in the next battle. It was a constant cycle of victory and then defeat, and it wore on us all. But despite the hardships, we never lost hope. We believed that one day we would prevail, that we would defeat Morgoth and his army once and for all. We held on to that belief even when all seemed completely lost. And then, one day, we received a piece of information that changed everything. A spy had managed to infiltrate Morgoth's inner circle, and he had learned of a secret stronghold where Morgoth himself was hiding. This was our chance, our one and only chance to end this war. We gathered our forces and made our way to the stronghold, determined to take down Morgoth once and for all, only to discover it was a ruse, a trap set by Morgoth to significantly lower our numbers. And seeing no alternatives, I decided to seek out a wizard with immense power. I knew that we needed more than just our swords and bows to defeat Morgoth. We needed something powerful, something magical. And so I set out to find the wizard that I had heard rumours of, a wizard with immense power and knowledge of ancient magic. Chapter 4 New Weapon and New Hope Let's get straight into that. I knew that we needed more than just our swords and bows to defeat Morgoth. We needed something powerful, something magic. And so I set out to find the wizard that I had heard rumours of, a wizard with immense power and knowledge of ancient magic. It was a perilous journey, fraught with danger at every turn. But I was determined to find this wizard, no matter the cost. After weeks and weeks of travelling, I finally found him in a hidden tower deep in the mountains. The wizard was old and wise, his eyes deep and piercing, and his voice like thunder. He listened to my plea and nodded solemnly. Yes, I have the power you seek, he said, but it will come at a great cost. I knew then that I had to do whatever it took to defeat Morgoth and save Garamond, and so I accepted the wizard's terms, even though I did not fully understand the consequences of my decision. And the wizard led me to a dark chamber deep within the tower, where he began to perform a ritual of immense power. I felt the ground shake and the air grow heavy with magic, and then there was a blinding flash of light, and I was consumed by it. When I awoke, I found myself in a strange place, a realm unlike any I had ever seen before. It was a secret realm, hidden away from a world of Garamond. I knew then that this was the price I had paid for the wizard's power. Yet I did not despair. 
I knew that I had to use this newfound power to defeat Morgoth and save my people. And so I began to explore this secret realm, seeking out knowledge and magic that could aid me in my quest. Days turned to weeks, and weeks turned into months. I delved deeper and deeper into the secrets of this realm, learning all that I could. When finally I emerged, my power greatly increased and ready to face Morgoth once more. I gathered Rhaegar, Wolfric, Rothgar, Snarlamain, and the remaining soldiers of Garamond to plan our next move. We knew that Morgoth had grown stronger, but so had we, and with my newfound power, we had a chance to defeat him once and for all. We travelled to the ruins of Arbor Haven, the site of our greatest defeat. But this time, we were prepared. We had learned from our mistakes, and we had a new strategy. As we approached the city, we could see that Morgoth's army was waiting for us, but instead of charging straight into battle, we took a different approach. We sent a small group of soldiers to draw the enemy out, while the rest of us waited in the shadows. And as expected, Morgoth's army followed the decoy soldiers, and we launched a surprise attack from behind. It was a fierce battle, but with our new strategy and increased power, we were able to hold our ground. And as the battle raged on, I searched for Morgoth, determined to face him once and for all. And then I saw him. He was standing on a hill, watching the battle unfold with a smug expression upon his face, for he had just killed Remus. As I rushed to where Remus had fallen, my heart sank at the sight before me. His body lay lifeless, surrounded by a pool of his own blood, and I fell to my knees beside him, tears streaming down my face. I gently lifted his head and cradled it in my arms, my hands trembling with grief and rage. How could Morgoth have taken him from me? Remus had been my closest confidant, my adviser, my friend. He had always been there for me, through thick and thin. And as I looked upon his lifeless face, I felt a fierce determination take a hold of me. I vowed to avenge his death and to rid Garamond of Morgoth's evil once and for all. Remus had believed in me, and I would honour his memory by carrying on his legacy. I stayed by his side for what felt like hours, unwilling to let him go. Eventually, I knew I had to move on, but I could never forget him. Remus would always hold a special place within my heart, and I would carry his memory with me for the rest of my life. I stood up and tightened my grip on my sword, and then I charged towards him the demon that took my friend from me. He met me with his own sword, and we clashed in a fierce battle. But this time, I had the upper hand. My new power gave me an edge, and I was able to overpower him. But just as I was about to deliver the final blow, Morgoth vanished into thin air. I searched for him, but he was nowhere to be found. It was clear that he had escaped once again. But this time, we were not defeated. We had held our ground, and we had come closer than ever before to defeating Morgoth. We knew that the battle was not over, but we were ready to continue the fight. Shortly after we regrouped and prepared for the next battle, we knew that Morgoth was still out there, plotting his next move, but we were ready for him. And with my new power and a new strategy, we were confident that we could finally defeat him and bring peace to Garamond. Once and for all. I knew we had time before the war could recommence yet again, and so I temporarily disbanded the great army of Garamond so that we could return to our families, grieve for our losses, and try to rebuild, bigger, stronger and better than before. I was unaware at the time, but when my brother died, my men and I were cured of our lycanthropy curse, and we became mortal once more. And over the next few months, I worked tirelessly with the other leaders of Garamond to rebuild our cities and strengthen our defences. We knew that Morgoth would strike again, and we had to be ready for him. But even as we fortified our walls and trained our soldiers, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were only delaying the inevitable. It was during this time that I also began to hear whispers of a secret realm, a place beyond the boundaries of our world where powerful magic and ancient knowledge could be found. Some said that Morgoth himself had once travelled there in search of forbidden secrets, 
Others had claimed that it was a place of great evil, and that those who ventured there never returned. However, I knew better, for I realized that I myself had journeyed there and gained the magical knowledge held within. And despite the warnings, I knew that I had to see this realm again, and if there was any chance of defeating Morgoth once and for all, I needed to find every advantage that I could. And so I set out on a journey to discover the secrets of this mysterious realm, accompanied only by a small group of trusted advisors and warriors. And after weeks of travel, we finally arrived at the entrance to the secret realm. As we descended into the depths of the earth, I could feel the magic in the air, a tangible force that seemed to seep into my very bones. And yet, as we journeyed deeper and deeper into the realm, I could sense that something, or something was not quite right. It was then that we encountered the guardians of the realm, powerful beings of ancient magic who warned us that we were not welcome there. They spoke of great danger and unspeakable horrors that lurked in the shadows, waiting to consume anyone foolish enough to seek out the secrets of the realm. And I proudly proclaimed that I had already journeyed there and that we would be more than a match for any horrors that might await. Chapter 5 Into the Depths Let's get straight into that. We, my companions and I, confidently strode forwards into the dark depths in search of the portal to the world of magic. The air was thick and musty. The only light came from the flickering torches that we held. We walked deeper and deeper into the depths, following the winding tunnels and passageways that led us closer to our goal. And as we moved forward, I couldn't help but feel a sense of foreboding. The magic in this place, oh, it was palpable, and I could feel it seeping into my very being. I knew that we were getting closer to the portal, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible was waiting for us. We continued on, our footsteps echoing through the tunnels. We passed by strange creatures and eerie relics, all of which seemed to be relics of long-forgotten past. I could see the fear in my companion's eyes, but I knew that we had come too far to turn back now. And finally, after what felt like an eternity, we came upon a massive chamber. At the centre of the chamber was a swirling vortex of energy, and I knew immediately that this was the portal we had been searching for. I stepped forward, and as I did, the vortex began to pulse with a blinding light. I could feel the magic coursing through my veins, and I knew that this was my chance to change everything. And with a deep breath, I stepped into the portal, feeling myself being pulled through the fabric of reality. The world around me began to blur and distort, and I felt as though I was falling through the void. And then, just as suddenly as it had started, I was over. And I found myself standing in a world that I could only describe as a dream. The colours were brighter, the air was thicker, and I could feel the magic pulsing through the very ground beneath my feet. I turned to look at my companions, and I could see the awe and wonder in their eyes. We had made it to the world of magic, and I knew that our journey had only just begun. We spent the first few days exploring the new world, marvelling at its beauty and the wonders it held. We were greeted by strange and wondrous creatures, some of which we had never heard of before. We made friends with fairies, talked to unicorns, and even rode on the backs of giant eagles. It truly was a world unlike any other, but I felt like I was living in a dream. But our time for exploration was limited. We had a mission to accomplish, and we couldn't afford to waste any more time. We had to learn as best as we could so that we could all be better prepared for the vampires and their master. After a week of exploring and learning, we made our way back to the portal, and after two days finally, we stood before the portal, its shimmering surface beckoning us home. But as we stepped closer, I couldn't shake the feeling that something or something was wrong. I turned to my companions and I could see the same unease reflected in their eyes. We all knew that something was about to happen, something that we couldn't possibly have foreseen. And then it happened. The portal erupted in a burst of magical energy, throwing us all back. And when I opened my eyes, I saw that we were no longer in the world of magic. We were in a place that I had never seen before. 
a world that was dark and twisted, a world that was filled with unimaginable horrors. I knew then that our journey had taken a turn for the worse. We were no longer in control of our fate, and I feared for what lay ahead. We could see vampires flying everywhere. We realized that this was where Morgoth was hiding. My heart sank as I looked around at a desolate landscape. The sky was filled with dark clouds, and the air was thick with the stench of decay. The ground littered with bones and debris, and I could hear the distant howls of werewolves and the screams of tortured souls. I turned to my companions, and I could see the fear and uncertainty in their eyes. We had been thrown into a world of darkness and evil, a world that we were not prepared to face. But I knew that we had to keep moving forward, for there was no turning back now. And as we cautiously made our way through the twisted landscape, we encountered more and more creatures of darkness. We fought off hordes of vampires and werewolves, and we even came face to face with demons and other unspeakable horrors. But, despite the odds against us, we persevered. We knew that our mission was too important to fail, and we were determined to find Morgoth and put an end to his evil once and for all. And so we pressed on, deeper and deeper into the heart of darkness, our resolve strengthened with every step. We knew that the final battle was approaching, and we were ready to face it, no matter what horrors lay ahead. And as we made our way through the twisted landscape, we encountered more werewolves, but these werewolves were not like any we had faced before. They were wild and twisted, with eyes that glowed red in the darkness. They attacked us on sight, and we were forced to fight for our very lives. And despite the danger, we still pressed on. We had come too far to turn back now, and we were determined to find Morgoth and put an end to his evil once and for all. But, as we journeyed deeper into this twisted world, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. It was as if Morgoth was always one step ahead of us, taunting us with his presence, but always staying just out of reach. We were in for the fight of our lives, and I knew that only our strength, determination, and the power of magic could we hope to emerge victorious. Chapter 6 Undying Lands Let's get straight into that. As we made our way through the twisted and dangerous world, we encountered many challenges and fought against creatures that I never thought could exist. But we were determined to find Morgoth and put an end to his reign of terror. And after weeks and weeks of travel, we finally came upon a glimmer of hope. We stumbled upon a group of elves who were also fighting against Morgoth and his minions. They welcomed us with open arms and shared their knowledge of the land and its inhabitants. With the elves by our side, we were able to make progress against Morgoth's forces. But even with their help, we knew that we were facing an uphill battle. It wasn't until we met a wise wizard named Karos that we began to see a true path to victory. Karos had insight into Morgoth's plans and was able to help us devise a strategy to defeat him. It was a long and grueling battle. We faced many challenges and setbacks along the way, but we persevered and slowly but surely we began to gain ground. And as we fought, we learned more about the nature of Morgoth's power and the world he had created. We discovered that it was not just a physical realm, but also a manifestation of his own twisted thoughts and desires. The very fabric of reality was warped and twisted under his influence, and the creatures that dwelled there were twisted and corrupted reflections of what they once were. But we did not falter. We pressed on, driven by our determination to defeat Morgoth and put an end to his reign of terror. And eventually, after many long months of fighting, we finally stood on the brink of victory. And we made our final push towards Morgoth's fortress. The ground shook beneath our feet and the sky darkened with a thick black fog. The very air seemed to vibrate with the force of Morgoth's power, and I knew that we were in for the fight of our lives. We charged forward, our weapons raised high, and our hearts filled with a determination to end Morgoth's tyranny once and for all. And as we approached his fortress, we were met with a wave after wave of his minions. Wild, twisted creatures, corrupted beyond recognition, swarmed towards us, but we fought back with all of our might. And the battle was fierce. Many of our comrades fell in the face of Morgoth's power. 
but we pushed forward, drawing upon the strength we had gained from our experiences and the bonds we had formed with each other. And as we breached the gates of Morgoth's fortress, we could feel the very air grow heavy with his presence. We knew that he was waiting for us, and we braced ourselves for the final showdown. Now the battle that followed was the most intense I had ever experienced. Spells and weapons clashed, and the very ground trembled with each blow. Morgoth's power it was overwhelming, and for a moment it seemed as if all was lost. But then something miraculous happened. The sky cleared, and a beam of light broke through the clouds shining down upon us. It was then that we realized that we were not fighting alone. The Valar, the powerful beings who ruled over the universe, had come to our aid. And with their help, we were finally able to overcome Morgoth's power. And he was cast out of the world forever. But the aftermath of the battle uh, was bittersweet. We had won, but at great cost. Many of our comrades had fallen and the world we had fought so hard to save was forever scarred by Morgoth's presence. But even in the face of such tragedy, we found hope. We had come together, united by a common goal, and in the end, we had triumphed. As I stood on the battlefield, surveying the wreckage of our long and arduous journey, I knew that I would carry the memories of our journey with me for the rest of my life. And though the path we had taken had been difficult, I knew that it had been worth it for it had led us to victory and a brighter future. And as the final battle raged on, I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. I was too focused on fighting, on staying alive and defeating Morgoth once and for all. But as the battle drew to a close and we emerged victorious, I began to feel an unfamiliar sensation. At first, it was just a twinge of pain in my neck, but it quickly grew worse. I felt dizzy and weak, and I struggled to stay upon my feet. It wasn't until one of my companions pointed out the bite mark on my neck that I realized what had happened. I had been bitten by a vampire. At first, I was terrified. I knew that becoming a vampire would mean losing my humanity, becoming a monster like the ones we had been fighting against. But then Karos approached me and spoke to me in a calm voice, assuring me that there was a way to prevent the transformation. He explained that if I drank the blood of a unicorn, it would counteract the vampiric curse and prevent me from turning into a creature of the night. At first I, well, I was sceptical, but I trusted Karos, and so we set out to find a unicorn. Now, it wasn't an easy task, but eventually we found one in a secluded glade deep in the forest, and with Karos's guidance I drank the unicorn's blood and felt a rush of warmth spread through my body. The pain and weakness it began to subside, and I knew then that a curse had been lifted. Looking back, I now realize how close I came to losing myself to the darkness. But thanks to the quick thinking of Karos and the trust of my companions, I was able to resist the vampiric curse and remain true to myself. And as we returned to our world, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief mixed with sadness. The victory over Morgoth had come at great cost and we had lost many friends and allies along the way but there was still so much work to be done. Our world had changed in our absence. We had to navigate a new political landscape and rebuild our lives in the wake of our victory. It was during this time that I began to notice the effects of my vampire bite. While Karras's cure had saved me from turning into a full-fledged vampire, I still had certain abilities and weaknesses that came with the territory. I found myself more sensitive to sunlight and struggling to resist the urge to feed on blood. Ah, it was a constant struggle, but I was determined not to let it control me. And as time went on, I learned to control my vampiric abilities and use them to my advantage. My heightened senses and strength proved useful in battle, and I was able to use my powers to protect those I cared about. But I knew I had to be careful, as there were still those who would see me as a threat. And we spent months rebuilding our cities and helping our people heal from the wounds of war. It was a slow and difficult process, but we were determined to make things right. I worked closely with the leaders of our world to establish new alliances and partnerships, and we made many great strides towards a brighter future. But even as we worked to rebuild, there were still those who sought to sow discord and division. We had enemies both old and new, 
we had to remain vigilant to ensure that our victory over Morgoth was not in vain. Chapter 7 Final Farewells and Expansion Let's get straight into that. After three long years of rebuilding and restoring our world, it was time to pay tribute to those we had lost in a battle against Morgoth. One of my closest friends and allies, Remus, had fallen in battle, and it was my duty to lay his body to rest. I had a beautiful marble tomb constructed in his honour, decorated with intricate carvings and inscriptions detailing his heroic deeds. We held a grand ceremony to honour his memory, and I delivered a heartfelt eulogy that brought tears to the eyes of many who attended. As I stood there looking down at Remus's final resting place, I couldn't help but feel a sense of closure. It had been a long and difficult journey, but we had overcome incredible odds and emerged victorious. And though we had lost many friends and allies along the way, their sacrifices or well, they would never be forgotten. But even as we mourned those we had lost, we knew that our work was well, not yet done. There were still many challenges and obstacles to overcome, and we had to remain vigilant to ensure that our world remained safe and prosperous for generations to come. And so, with a heavy heart but a sense of determination, I turned my focus towards the future. There were new battles to be fought, new challenges to be overcome, and new victories to be won. But with the memory of Remus and all of those who had fallen by our side, we would face whatever lay ahead with courage and strength. In the months that followed, we continued our work to rebuild and restore our world. We established new allies and partnerships, and we worked tirelessly to heal the wounds of war. It was a slow and difficult process, but we were determined to make things right. And as we moved forward, we encountered new challenges and obstacles. There were those who sought to exploit the chaos of the post-war world, using the power vacuum to advance their own interests. We had to remain vigilant and ready to act to ensure that our world remained safe and free. And so we fought on through new battles and challenges, each one bringing us closer to a brighter future. We never forgot those we had lost and we honoured their memory by continuing to fight for the ideals that they had died for. In time, our world was transformed. It was a world of peace and prosperity, where every individual had opportunity to thrive and succeed. And though we knew that there would always be new challenges and obstacles to overcome, we faced them with courage and determination, knowing that we had strength to overcome anything. And as I looked out over the world that we had helped to create, I felt a sense of pride and satisfaction. We had come so far and we had accomplished so much, but there was still so much more to be done. And I knew that I would never stop fighting for a better world. As I sat there deep in thought, I realized that the world was changing once again. The threats we faced, well, they were no longer just from the Dark Lords and powerful armies. There were new dangers emerging, threats that were more subtle, but just as deadly. I knew that we needed to adapt and evolve to meet these new challenges, and so I began to seek out new allies and form new partnerships. I reached out to leaders and experts in various fields, seeking their knowledge and expertise to help us better understand the changing world around us. We established new institutions and organizations dedicated to the study and defense of our world. We trained new generations of warriors, mages, and scholars, ensuring that our world would always be ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. Chapter 8 Drums in the Deep Let's get straight into that. Deep below the White Mountains, drums began to sound. The trolls have returned to Garamond with one goal in mind, death and destruction. Pillaging and plundering, the troll race had not been seen in Garamond in over 200 years, not since the death of the Night Stalker. The sound of drums echoed through the mountains and sent a chill down my spine. I knew that the trolls are not to be underestimated, and that they posed a grave threat to our world. We had to act fast if we were to prevent a disaster. I gathered my companions and we set out towards the White Mountains, determined to put an end to the trolls' rampage. And as we journeyed deeper into the mountains, we encountered many dangers and obstacles, but we pressed on, 
driven by our determination to protect our world from harm. And finally, we reached the heart of the troll encampment. The air was thick with a stench of rot and decay, and the ground was littered with bones of their victims. But we did not falter. We stood our ground and prepared for battle. The trolls came at us with a ferocity that I have never seen before. They were huge and powerful. Their weapons were crude but deadly. But we were prepared. We fought with all of our strength, using every skill and tactic that we had learned in our battles against Morgoth and his minions. But the trolls, well, they were relentless. But we were determined to hold our ground. Our weapons clashed against their thick skin, and we used our knowledge of their weaknesses to take them down one by one. It was a grueling battle, and we suffered many losses, but we stood firm. As the sun began to set on the battlefield, the sound of drums grew fainter and fainter. The trolls were retreating, and we had emerged victorious once again. But the victory, well, it was bittersweet. We had lost many brave warriors in the fight, and the trolls would surely return again. And we took stock of our losses and tended to the wounded. We knew that we had to be prepared for the troll's next attack, and we worked tirelessly to strengthen our defences and train our soldiers. Days turned to weeks, and weeks turned into months. The sounds of drums in the deep became a distant memory, but we never forgot the threat that the trolls posed. We continued to prepare, knowing that our peace was fragile and could be shattered at any moment. And then, one day, the drums sounded again. We knew that the trolls had returned, we braced ourselves for another battle. But this time, we were ready. We had learned from our past mistakes, and we fought with even greater determination and skill. The battle, huh, it was fierce, but we did emerge victorious once again. This time, the trolls, they did not retreat. They were defeated. And we knew that we had sent a clear message to any who would dare threaten our world again. As we tended to the wounded and counted our losses, I couldn't help but feel a sense of pride and determination. We had faced great challenges and overcome them, and we would continue to do so. For as long as there was evil in the world, we would stand firm and fight back with all of our strength. And as we surveyed the aftermath of the battle, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. It was too easy. The trolls had come at us with such ferocity, and yet we had managed to defeat them without any casualties. It just didn't add up. And as we began to search the area, we discovered a hidden entrance to a cavern deep below the White Mountains. It was then that we realized that this was just the beginning. The trolls had been a diversion, a mere distraction from their true goal. We knew that we had to act fast. We gathered our most skilled fighters and made our way into the cavern. And as we descended deeper into the darkness, we could hear the sound of drums pounding in the distance. It was a haunting and ominous sound, one that sent shivers down our spines. And as we approached the source of the sound, we could see that the trolls had indeed returned, but they were not alone. They had allied themselves with dark and powerful forces, creatures that I had never seen before. They were twisted and corrupted, with glowing red eyes and razor-sharp claws. Of course, we fought with all of our strength, but it soon became clear that we were outnumbered and outmatched. We were pushed back and forced to retreat, our ranks thinning with every passing moment. It wasn't until we stumbled upon a hidden chamber that we began to see a glimmer of hope. There, we discovered ancient relics of great power, artifacts that could turn the tide of battle in our favor. We knew that we had to use them wisely, and so we crafted a plan. With the relics in our possession, we launched a surprise attack on the trolls and their allies. The battle was fierce and intense, with explosions and flashes of light illuminating a dark cavern. But we fought with all of our strength, fueled by the knowledge that this was our last chance to save our world. In the end, we emerged victorious. The trolls and their allies were defeated, and we had saved our world from certain destruction. But it had come at a great cost. Many of our friends and allies had fallen in battle, and the caverns had been destroyed, leaving a great rift in the earth. As we emerged from the caverns, we were met with a new challenge. The rift had caused a great disturbance in the land, and we knew that we had to work quickly to restore the balance. It was a long and difficult process, but we worked tirelessly 
using the relics we had found to heal the land and repair the damage that had been done. And in the end, we emerged victorious once again, having saved our world from yet another great threat. It was a hard-fought victory, but it was one that we had earned through our determination, courage, and strength. Chapter 9 A Time of Contemplation Let's get straight into that. After the battle under the White Mountains, myself, Wolfric, Rothgar had returned to my mansion. And as we sat in my mansion in Terra Vale, nursing pints of beer, we couldn't help but reflect on the past 30 years of war, during which time we had fought against some of the most powerful and malevolent creatures in all of Garamond, and we had emerged victorious, but at what cost? I looked at my two companions, Wolfric and Rothgar, and saw the scars of war etched upon their faces. We had lost many friends and allies along the way, and we had seen countless horrors that would haunt us for the rest of our lives. But despite it all, we had never given up. We had fought with every ounce of our strength, and we had prevailed. As we sat in silence, lost in our own thoughts, I couldn't help but feel a sense of pride in what we had accomplished. We had saved our world from the brink of destruction, and we had restored hope to those who had lost it. But there was still much work to be done. Our world had been changed forever by the war, and we had to find a way to move forward. I raised my pint in a toast to my companions, to Warfric and Rothgar, the bravest warriors I have ever known. We may have won the war, but our work is far from done. Let us raise our swords and continue to fight for a better Garamond. But they both raised their pints in response. To our fearless leader, who led us to victory against all odds, we will continue to fight by your side, no matter the challenge. And as we drank our beers, I couldn't help but wonder what the future held for us. But one thing was for certain. We would face it together as brothers in arms. And we sat there, drinking and reflecting. I realized that our bond had grown stronger than ever before. The years of war had brought us together in a way that nothing else could, and we had become a family. We had fought side by side, bled together and triumphed together. But there was still much work to be done. The world was still a dangerous place, and there were still those who sought to do harm. But we were ready. We had honed our skills and sharpened our blades, and we were prepared to face whatever challenges lay ahead. And so, with a renewed sense of purpose and a deep sense of camaraderie, we raised our pints once more and toasted to the future. We would face it together with courage and strength, and we would emerge victorious once again. And we talked long into the night, reminiscing about our battles and sharing stories of our adventures. We laughed, we cried, and we drank until the early hours of the morning. It was a fitting celebration of all that we had accomplished together. But even as we reveled in our triumphs, we knew that there was still dangerous lurking. But even as we reveled in our triumphs, we knew that there was still dangerous lurking in the shadows. Morgoth may have been defeated but there were other threats in our world that we had to be prepared to face. The world was once again changing, and we had to adapt with it. New alliances, they had to be forged. New technologies had to be developed, and new threats had to be neutralized. As I bid my friends good night and retired to my chambers, I knew that the future, or it was uncertain, but I also knew that we were ready to face whatever lay ahead. Together, we had overcome incredible odds, and I had no doubt that we would continue to do so in the years to come. And with that thought in mind, I drifted off to sleep, dreaming of a bright and prosperous future for our world. As I awoke the next morning, I felt a sense of renewed purpose. The previous night's conversation with Warfric and Rothgar had reminded me that our work was not yet done. There were still enemies to face and challenges to overcome, but with my loyal companions by my side, I knew that we could face anything. I got dressed and made my way to the council chamber, where the leaders of our world were waiting for me. We had important matters to discuss, including the ongoing threat of rogue elements seeking to destabilize our world. And as we deliberated, 
I couldn't help but think of Remus and all the others who had sacrificed their lives in our battles against Morgoth. Their memory would always be with me, and I would continue to honour them by fighting for a better future for our people. After the council meeting was adjourned, I spent the rest of the day meeting with various leaders and allies, forging new partnerships and solidifying existing ones. It was a tedious but necessary task, and one that required a great deal of diplomacy and tact. But amidst all the political manoeuvring, I never lost sight of our ultimate goal, a world free from tyranny of evil and chaos. And I knew that, with support of my friends and allies, we could achieve that goal, no matter how long it would take. As the day drew to a close, I retired to my chambers once more, exhausted but fulfilled. I had done everything I could to ensure the safety and prosperity of our world, and I knew that a battle would continue for years to come. But with my loyal companions by my side, I was ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. Chapter 10 Two Worlds Let's get straight into that. As the new king of Galvatorix, death spread throughout the land. I couldn't help but feel a sense of curiosity and excitement. For years, we had heard stories and rumours of a land called Allegesia, and a dragon rider named Aragon, who had defeated the evil king and restored peace to the land. And now, it seemed that fate had brought our worlds together. I ordered my advisors to prepare a diplomatic mission, and within weeks, I found myself standing before Aragon and his majestic dragon, Saphira. It was a sight to behold, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe at the sight of a dragon. I had never seen anything like it before. Aragon and I spoke at length, exchanging stories of our respective worlds and sharing our experiences of war and battle. And despite the differences between our worlds, it was clear that we shared a common bond as warriors and leaders. And as we talked, I couldn't help but feel a sense of gratitude for the opportunity to meet such a noble and courageous individual. I knew that our meeting would have profound impact on the future of our two worlds, and that together we could achieve great things. In the years that followed, we established a strong and diplomatic relationship between our kingdoms, sharing resources, knowledge, and technology. Aragon and Sephira became regular visitors to Garamond, and our people marveled at their presence. And though we faced many challenges and obstacles in the years that followed, I ended up with Aragon and Sephira by our side. We would always emerge victorious. Our worlds had come together in a way that I could never have imagined, and I felt honoured to be a part of it. Our kingdoms had so much to learn from each other, and I made sure to invite Aragon and Sephira to my palace, often to discuss matters of importance. We talked of magic, of dragons, and of many creatures that inhabited our respective worlds. I even took Aragon on a hunting trip through the forests of Terra Vale, where we bonded over and shared our love of the hunt. And as time passed, Aragon and Sephira became more than just allies to me. They became trusted friends, and I found myself confiding in them about matters close to my heart. They listened with empathy and offered words of wisdom, and I knew that I could always count on them for support. And so, as I look back on those years, I am filled with gratitude for the friendship that we forged. And though our worlds are vastly different, we found common ground in our shared values of honour, courage and loyalty. I knew that as long as we stood together, well, there was nothing that we could not overcome. I am currently sitting in my study, surrounded by books and artefacts from my adventures. I am older now, but the memory of those days past is still sharp and vivid. And as I recount my story, I can't help but feel grateful for all of those people who stood by my side throughout my journey. And as I think of Wolfric, Rothgar, Uncle Rhaegar, and Snarl and Main, I also think of the unlikely alliances between Garamond and Allegesia, brought together by fate and the courage of Aragon and Sephira. Our two worlds were forever changed by our meeting, and the friendship we forged will always be so cherished. And now, as I close this chapter of my life and lay down my pen, I feel content in the knowledge that 
I have lived a life full of adventure, bravery, and love. And though my time in this world may be coming to a close, I know that my legacy will live on through the people and the stories that I leave behind. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What an absolutely magical, enthralling, intense and action-packed storyline there. And a great sequel to The Werewolves of Terrell Vale for an incredible mind of Luke Reason, exclusive to the DMT Forest of Fear channel. A mighty thank you, Luke, for your patience and, of course, your incredible penmanship. Absolutely thrilling stuff to read this. Great characters, great imagination, great world building. A complete five-star story all round. Of course, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I am. And I really look forward to your next piece of work. Well, guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you think you can pen a story pack in this much punch, then please do get in touch with me at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope you're all happy and well and fighting fit, having a fantastic start to the year, and are looking forward to the incredible sunshine and strolls through the forest and having a picnic. Whatever it is that you do, I hope you're giving it your all and are enjoying life. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry. My father, 21 years ago, slew the Night Stalker with a legendary... And then lowered my voice to a sickly sweet whisper before Adam. And don't worry, brother. I am not going to kill you. Death is too merciful for someone like you. Instead, you are banished from Terror Vale. Leave this city and never return. <coughs> I need your services and that of the elves. And as your king, I expect both yourself and the elves to be let up. And as your king, I expect both yourselves and the elves. Fuck you! Fuck off, you fucking rats with wings. It wasn't until we met a wise wizard named Karos that we began to see a true path to... And it wasn't... It wasn't... It wasn't until... What did it do? And we knew that we... And we knew that we... And we knew that. And we knew that we. And we knew that 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 we knew that